This is a sample chapter from Fitton Books. Six Feet Under, Chapter 11. The astounded Jones peered out his front window at the cherry red Mustang Cobra parked at the curb. He rushed into the foyer and opened the front door. On the threshold was a legal sized white envelope containing keys and a handwritten note from Coco telling him he would be surprised what he could do inside that sports car. Jones grinned. Amazing! In just two hours, after driving around Hamilton like a first time race car driver on the track, Jones, his hands on the leather steering wheel, revved up the Mustang through the Devonshire Hills toward the notch. Being able to accelerate easily from 70 miles an hour gave him a sense of power until the red and blue lights began flashing on the Prince William side of the hills. He recognized the cop as Corky Corrigan, a failed Prince William cop who lingered on the force for years. Corrigan's compact body rocked from side to side and he stroked his gray mustache. Corrigan wore a battered white motorcycle helmet even though he drove a regular cruiser. Jones saw himself in the Mustang in Corrigan's reflective sunglasses. Officer Corrigan. Coach Jones, I usually spot you uh, racing your Jeep and uh, Prince William. License and registration. I don't drag race my Jeep anywhere, said Jones, taking out his license. He found the registration under the visor. The Jeep was just destroyed in a fire. Maybe if you slowed down, creep. What? asked Jones, studying his badge. Woodrow C. Corrigan? Officer Corrigan to you. Corky, he pointed at Jones. Any more guff from you and you'll be visiting Pinky Harris over the state police barracks. I got carried away with this new car. You're going to pay, Jones. 90 in a 45 mile an hour zone? 90? That's ridiculous. I'll fight that ticket, Corky. You think Judge Cutter is going to give you a break? He'll throw the book at you and you'll go down, creep. Cutter hates speeders. What is he, the hanging judge? Not a bad idea, said Corrigan as he stepped back toward the cruiser and wrote up the ticket. Jones's phone rang. Don't answer it. You can't tell me not to answer my phone. Insubordination. I'll add that to the charges. Jones. Hey, Jonesy, I just cleared the meeting with Chick. Good. Word is all over town, you deck the Iron Man. He came after me in my own kitchen, Coco, said Jones as he studied Corrigan back at the cruiser writing up the ticket. Nobody ever KO'd the Iron Man. I'll put it on my resume. Don't be a wise ass. Where are you? I'm just over the notch. I got stopped by Corky Corrigan. That sleazeball? He's writing a ticket. That is, if he knows how to write. Don't take any guff from that clown, said Coco. I have no choice. Corrigan used to be a beat cop at Salem Heights. Let's just say he borrowed from the police pension fund. Nail him on that before he traces the Mustang, Jonesy. The guy's a thief. They're letting him pay it back. Pacheco swept it under the rug because Corrigan is his brother-in-law. You ask him about the office's pension fund and see what happens. Then get over to the gym. I have to pick up Uncle Dulio later at the smorgasbord. I'll see you at Chicks. The swaying Corrigan meandered along the road shoulder and back to the Mustang. His smile bordered on arrogant. He threw the license and registration at Jones. This car is registered in South Boston to the Fiore organization. Dave Toomey. I'm gonna throw the book at you, Jones. Kip Bosco told me you were trouble. Kip Bosco is a crooked vice cop. He's my buddy, said Corrigan, holding up the yellow ticket. Is that right? Did he ever see any of the cash from the office's pension fund? Corrigan's mouth froze. His eyes did not blink and the ticket attached to his pinched fingers furrowed in midair. How do you know about the pension fund? You know, Corky, cops in glass houses shouldn't... I don't live in no glass house. Corrigan slowly retracted the ticket. He twitched his thick mustache. You have a nice day. Jones leaned back to the headrest and laughed as Corrigan stomped back to the cruiser. Corrigan gazed back at the Mustang one time before slipping inside the police car. Jones raced the RPM meter and pushed the accelerator as he popped the clutch. 
Corrigan and the cruiser soon faded away in a swirl of dust and smoke as Jones smoothly increased speed along the rock ledge. It was soon slowed as the house on the periphery of Prince William appeared. The stone spires of St. Bart's rose into the autumn sky a half a mile ahead. Gallagher had a spreading yellow maple at the corner of the rectory lot. Jones made several turns toward the water. Corey's gym on the second floor of a brick building from the 20th century was along the docks not too far from where Coco and his brother Anthony grew up on Canal Street. Jones parked the car on the street at least 50 feet from the building. He stepped outside as Coco's gray beamer moved over the hill. Coco swung into a hidden driveway. Jones met him in the front of a large wood panel door under a faded red and black sign to Corey's gym. You didn't get a ticket, did you, Jonesy? No, I did not, said Jones as Coco pulled open the heavy door. Everybody's got a pressure point, bro, he said as they climbed the steep wood stairs, lighted only by a couple of windows on the landing above. The sound of boxing gloves smacking, exercise equipment shaking the floor, and someone barking out instructions created an old-time atmosphere. He was stunned. Good. Corrigan thinks he's a tough guy, but he's a pussycat. Jones followed Coco into an expansive area with a high, metal gridded ceiling. A few dozen men worked out on the exercise machines or punched the worn leather bags. A bench press and barbells formed the rear wall in front of a massive wall mirror. Under the tall windows, what appeared to be a regulation sized ring with actual sparring partners had been elevated over the wood plank floor. Several women in tight yoga pants wandered around the musty gym. A craggy-faced man with thinning, wispy hair smiled when he saw Coco. He wore a gray jersey with the gym name in blue letters, and he had a white towel around the nape of his neck. There's my man, said Chick as he cupped his hand and smacked the side of Coco's head. Jones had never seen anyone whack Coco. How's the club? Haven't seen you in there in a while, Chick. Things ain't like they used to be. He turned to Jones. I seen you in the papers, Jonesy. You're building up quite a record. Then again, after that Toad Lawson, you must look like a Superman, he said, shaking Jones's hands. It's all over the streets what you did to the Iron Man. He started it in my kitchen. That man's always had a temper, especially with a few pops, right, Coco? All three of them Brannigans are trouble, Chick. Chick waved his hand through the air. Old man Brannigan, Bose, fought here years ago before the Iron Man turned pro. He's punch drunk. The Iron Man was a fighter? I'm telling you, Jonesy, nobody ever took him out. Coco faced Chick. Listen, I have to pick up Dulio at the smorgasbord, all you can eat. Dulio will bankrupt them laughed Chick, his dark eyes becoming slits. We'll be back here in 15 or 20 minutes. You and Jonesy can have a conversation. Chick saluted Coco as Jones watched the sparring. Dulio bench pressed 500 six years ago. Nobody's ever beat that record. He's a strong guy, said Jones. You have a fight, Jonesy? A little in high school, nothing a note. Want to go a few rounds with Kid Palooka up there? Asked Chick. He's the one with the shaved head. Jones figured that Kid Palooka weighed at least 250, maybe close to 300 pounds. He wore an undershirt under his tank top and had bulging biceps larger than his legs. I'll, uh, I'll rest on my laurels, Chick. Son, I'll pay you $10,000 if you knock down Palooka. You don't have to knock him out. Jones produced a wide grin. You can't be serious. Chick smiled. He had a space between his two front teeth. Chick Corey is always serious. Look, I've never been trained in boxing skills. I'll give you a grand if you're still standing at the end of the round. I don't think so. Let me be frank with you. I've already got bets going down, not just in the gym, but around PW. It's even odds after what you did to the Iron Man. All I want to do is talk about Mobley. You want to talk about Mobley, then you'll have to go around with Palooka. All the money still stands. Chick, I'm taking my life into my hands. 
Just hit him, Mike. You hit the Iron Man, he said, holding Jones' elbow. I've got 6,000 on you. The Iron Man was invincible. Then I promise I'll talk as much as I can about Mobley. It will be worth your while. How long? Three minutes? 180 seconds. You can survive that, and if you do better, we all make money. What do you say? All right, one round. That's the boy. I'll tell the kid. Jones could not have cared less about the money. He wanted to know what happened to Mobley. Two blonde women in yoga pants approached Jones with shorts and maroon boxing gloves. You can change in the locker room, Jonesy, said the one with huge teeth. Let me give you a tip, honey, said the serious green-eyed one. What's that? asked Jones as they escorted him toward the locker room. Luca hurt his shoulder yesterday. He hit his shoulder and he won't be able to jab. Thanks. Jones looked in the ring. Luca gave him a brutal stare straight from hell. Oh, boy. Less than ten minutes later, Jones stood across from Paluca, a man at least five inches taller, with a reach that would keep him at bay. The stare had not abated, and his dark eyes made him even more formidable up close. Time lost its meaning when the bell sounded. Jones questioned why he had allowed Chick to talk him into facing this behemoth. The sound of the bell, Paluca jabbed, slowly pushing Jones across the ring. Jones prayed he would not be trapped in the corner. His quick jab, used against the Iron Man, had not come within a foot of Paluca's weak shoulder. Then he was hit with a punch to the ribs he hadn't seen coming. He backtracked, not like a fighter, but like someone running the 220. The crowd had gathered around the ring, and the yelling sounded like a championship match. Jones realized he would never get a chance to punch this Hulk. All he could do was circle and stay back. But Paluca was an experienced fighter. He bore in slowly, even though Jones stayed away from the ropes. The next punch came from Paluca's cocked right glove. Jones started coming, but could not get out of the way. The force knocked him onto the ropes and sent his mouthpiece into the crowd. He slid down the ropes, his nose bleeding and his cheek pulsating. The referee, a scrawny little One, man with electrified hair, two, began the count. Three, Somehow Jones sprang to his feet, four, shocking Paluca, who thought he had five, already won. He pummeled Paluca's stomach and shoulder. Then Paluca hit Jones with stinging counter punches and a right cross that sent him to the canvas. At first everything was black, but then the gridded ceiling came into view. He heard Paluca laughing at him as he climbed up the ropes. Jones raised his arms and gloves for protection. As Paluca called him a sissy sucker puncher, the larger man began an attack that felt like metal pipes against Jones's forearms. Coco's voice boomed over the crowd in the entire gathering. Hey, Chick, what are you doing? Get him out of there! Codulio leaped up and ripped the ropes from the stanchions. Then he yanked the rest of the ropes and threw the remains back into the gym. Paluca stared at Dulio and hit him with dozens of punches. Dulio just stood in place and then walked toward Paluca. Like a diesel train, Dulio advanced and lifted Paluca over his head and hurled him against the wall. Paluca's lifeless form bounced forward and ended up back in the ring. Dulio brushed his sports shirt. What the hell is going on here, chick? yelled Coco. Five seconds and Jones would have lasted the round. Five seconds and Paluca would have killed him. Are you losing your friggin' mind, chick? Coco climbed into what was left of the ring. Dulio checked Jones' face and wiped the blood off his cheek and nose. Jones, are you all right? I think so. You're going to PW Medical, bro. He turned to a chick who was telling everyone all bets were off. You got ethics violations here, Chick. That was real stupid. What about my boy Paloka? To hell with Paloka. You get up here and check out Jonesy, and then we're all taking him to Prince William Medical. Someone helped Chick into the flattened ring. Chick jogged across to Jones. Didn't think I'd last that long, did you, Chick? Asked Jones. Chick held Jones' face. Your nose is broken. Ribs aren't too good either, said Jones. If I were you, Chick, I'd get Paluca out of town now before word of this spreads, said Coco. 
Chick signaled to several guys along the side of the ring. Why the hell did this happen? 10,000 if I knocked him out. Grand if I lasted around or Chick wouldn't talk about Mobley. Well, you shyster. I got a good mind to call Mr. Fiore. We are just having fun, Coco. If Dulio hadn't come in here, Jonesy would have been screwed. Just another five seconds, Coco, said Jones. Shut up, Jonesy. You're as much at fault here as Chick. He turned to Chick as he applied a steptic pencil to Jones's cheek and nose. Okay, Chick, start talking. They brought Palooka on a stretcher around the ring and toward the stairs. Mobley, Mobley, this is a long time ago. A skillful boxer with a deadly knockout punch. Never mind that. Where is he? Asked Coco. I think somebody took him out, said Chick as he placed a band-aid over Jones's cut brow. Why do you say that? asked Jones. We owed him at least 15 grand in past earnings. He never came by to pick it up. Never heard from him or Betty Ann. Betty Ann? asked Jones. Did she wear a charm bracelet? Betty Ann Lovell, yeah, I remember the charm bracelet. She hung out here. She was Harry's girlfriend. This other guy kept picking her up. Word got around she was cheating on Harry. He kept a tight grip on the woman is what happened. I think he beat on her. I didn't blame her for getting picked up by some other guy. Did the other guy pick her up in a brown Toyota? Asked Jones. It was 25 years ago, Jonesy. How the hell do I know? Listen, said Coco. Put this place back together and just tell everyone that Jonesy was a fighter from Boston. I can have Fury's people cover. Chick approached Jones. No amateur lasted more than 30 seconds with Palooka, Jonesy. Never mind that, snapped Coco. You shouldn't be playing games like that. Dulio, follow us in the beam at a PW Medical. I'll drive the Mustang. Dulio stared down at Chick as he left what was left of the ring. Coco held Jones's elbow. Coco, I'm all right. Yeah, sure you are, champ. As they waited for x-rays, Uncle Dulio arrived with three trays from the hospital cafeteria. Jones felt the new bandage on his brow. Got coffee there, Dulio? Dulio handed him the cup. Jonesy, I'm impressed. Luca was regional champ for three years straight. How you didn't get killed is beyond me. When Father Gallagher gets here, I'll tell you. Father? He was the New England amateur champ. Granted, that was 15 years ago. But he knows offense and defense. Jones faced Dulio eating a huge Danish. Glad you showed up, Dulio. Dulio flashed him the thumbs up sign as he chewed the Danish. Luke is a boy. It's all done. He is all done. Mr. Fiore was furious with Chick. He likes you, Jonesy. Charlie would have sent Chick permanently packing. Right, Dulio? Charlie didn't waste time taking care of business. Damn lucky, Jonesy. Your nose should have been broken in ten places. But we learned why all the hullabaloo about Betty Ann. Somehow I think Lawson knew about this, said Coco. Maybe. Clayton should get the dental results this afternoon from Dr. McFadden in Hamilton. What did Morris say, Jonesy? How did the buried woman die? He said he's checking with Herbert Lane about releasing a statement. Did you have any luck getting a plate? Jonesy. He gave me three digits from some plate from 25 years ago. My contact at the registry laughed when I told him. The doctor came out in her blue scrubs. No damage. I'll get you a follow-up. The doctor is Dr. Bridegate? Right. Thank you, doctor. You can check out up front, Mr. Jones. Thank you. Thank God for small favors, said Coco as the orange-haired Gallagher, his Roman collar, darted through the ER. Thymus, what in heaven's name happened here? Heaven had nothing to do with it, Father. Dulio, said Gallagher. I'm aware of this man, Palooka. You had no business being in the ring with Palooka. What ring? Asked Coco as he looked toward Dulio. The Gallagher backpedal. Really? Asked Gallagher. And walking into the punch, that kind of worked. What the hell are you two talking about? You can move back with the punch to deaden the effect said Gallagher. So you bobbed and weaved. Correct. Still, Palooka is a pro. 
Not anymore, said Tulio, finishing the Danish. By the way, I had Mildred check the parish records from 25 years ago. No Betty Ann Lovell. When I go to the next ecumenical meeting at First Parish, I'll check with Pastor Sykes, see if she was a parishioner. That's not the question, Jim. The question is, who did she go with in the Toyota when she ditched Mobley? And why did she return? Then the Toyota, according to Jerry St. Clair, showed up again, but we don't know when the Toyota left because Jerry fell asleep. Gallagher raised his brows. Sounds like his epitaph. 